All right, ladies and gentlemen, footy season is over and officially the real stuff starts. Trade period is just around the corner. I think it starts November 4th, I believe. I think that's next Wednesday. The format literally changes every year or two. It was originally a trade week, then there was three weeks, and then there was a fortnight. And in this season, I had no idea what it was going to be, but it looks like November 4th to November 12th. So eight days is going to be this year's trade period. For me personally, I didn't know what kind of effect a coronavirus affected season would have on trade period. It made me wonder if players were gonna be less or more willing to move, I guess particularly if you're talking about moving to or from Melbourne right now, even though they're going all right. But for whatever reason, it looks like there's gonna be just as much, if not more, player movement than ever before. Is that coronavirus related? I'm not too sure. I'm guessing it's been a tough year for a lot of players, a lot of clubs. And maybe, you know, that's kind of led to them feeling a little bit disenfranchised. I don't know if that's the word. A little bit jaded with their current situation. Maybe that's driving players to want to switch it up a little bit. Or maybe, I don't know, this is just the modern reality of our game right now. We're going to get more and more player movement each year. Every single year after the grand final, the trade rumors and the silly season, it always starts earlier than I'm expecting. It's just like we've just had the grand final and people are already talking about the trades. I guess for most clubs, 16 out of 18, in fact, during grand final week and the final finals in general they've actually started putting work into trades and stuff but for whatever reason it just always surprises me how close it comes straight after the grand final but anyway like I said the rumors are swirling silly season is here and there's one rumor in particular that I assumed was part of silly season but it seems like there's a little bit of truth to that and of course I'm referring to Adam Trelaw now the downside with making videos on AFL trades at the moment is just that there's so much news every day that anything you say yesterday is old news. So naturally this situation is developed in the media quite quickly, but I'll give you a quick rundown if you're not familiar with what I'm referring to. Essentially, Collingwood player Adam Trelaw's wife signed a one-year deal with the Queensland Firebirds and the netball team. This, of course, led to a little bit of speculation that maybe Trelaw was going to move to Queensland as well because it's a fairly big thing for your partner to move to a different state. Naturally, being an athlete though, she has probably got to accept the best contract for her future. I don't know how good a netballer she actually is, but it's the same in the AFL as well. If you, you generally don't have too much choice, you go where the contract is. But naturally, people speculated that maybe this was foreshadowing a move of Adam Trelaw and his entire family to Queensland permanently. Trelaw came out and shut down this speculation, saying he was tied to the club for the next five years. So that appeared to be the issue laid to rest. Trelaw had no interest in playing football in Queensland. Now, this in itself is a little bit of a bombshell. It's not too obvious often that a club tells what appears to be a required and important player, because Adam Trelaw has been a high-performing midfielder for Collingwood for a number of years now, that they are no longer wanted. It doesn't really happen too often. Generally, a lot of movement by players is player-driven. It's not really the clubs being proactive in making strategic trades to get players out of their club. Now, from the sounds of it, the explanation they gave Trelaw is that they don't believe that he can perform to an elite standard of football with his wife and his young daughter living in another state. And I do understand that Trelaw has been out spoken about you know suffering from anxiety in the past so maybe there is some truth to what they're saying for me though it kind of does sound like an excuse and Kane Corns has really gone to town on Collingwood for the way they've handled this it does appear that they're a little bit more willing to navigate through some players personal issues but not willing to support Trelaw in trying to keep him at their club while he's got you know his family potentially away to me what they're saying might be valid but this kind of stinks of Collingwood not seeing Trelaw as a super important part of their future. A fairly reasonable indication of this is the fact that Jordan Dugowie has an assault case looming over his head and they are desperate to sound him on for another two years. Whereas if Trelaw, the attitude is, oh, if you, your partner can't stay with you, you might as well ship off. Well, I don't agree with Kane Corns too often and he's probably gone a little bit hard at the Collingwood Footy Club here. He's not actually on his own and commentators have been very critical of Collingwood showing a disloyalty to someone who desperately wants to play at their club and I think there is a bit of validity in that. Now I will qualify this by saying I'm taking what is being reported at face value. I don't know 100% if it's accurate but there is deafening silence from Collingwood publicly coming out and shutting this talk down. I think the lack of loyalty here, if this is indeed the case, could burn the pies down the track. Some of the players at their club might be looking at this situation and thinking, what if that were me? Would the club back me in in this situation? But more to the point, it is interesting to wonder what happens here with Adam Trelaw. You have to think that if these conversations are really being had, surely the relationship is frayed and it's hard to imagine Collingwood and Trelaw get along well enough to go into the 2021 season and beyond together. Now, why might Collingwood be doing this? I'd imagine 
They're looking at Trelaw's sizable contract, and I think it's on an average of over 800k a year. I don't know how accurate that is, but we can certainly accept that he is on a very large pay packet. Now, could they be trying a last-ditch attempt to secure Jeremy Cameron at the football club? I'm not too sure. It does sound like he is more or less destined for the Cats, but it would be a very valid reason for them to try and offload Trelaw in an attempt to gain a salary and be potentially a draft pick to trade to the Giants. Regardless, beyond that, you have to think that salary is a huge motivator for them, and maybe they just don't rate Trelaw's impact for their midfield despite his impressive stats and ability to find the ball. So if he doesn't stay with the Pies, the next question is where does he go? The Brisbane Lions have pretty much ruled themselves out for contention for his signature. They've got enough on their plate securing Joe Danaher who's probably a bigger need at the moment with a need for a big key forward and I think it's reported that they're offering 700k for him as well. So securing both of those players, probably not realistic and they're probably going to have a few big contracts to sign in the coming seasons. Then goal Coast have come out and said that they're not actually pushing for Trelaw if Trelaw doesn't actually want to come and play in Queensland. And I think that's a big focus for the Suns. They're not going to try and sign players who don't actually want to be there. So it looks like if Trelaw's going anywhere, he's going to move to another big rival in Victoria who's willing to pay that amount for his services. Now, the Pies won't want to strengthen a big rival in Victoria too much. And to be honest, someone like a Richmond probably can't afford him anyway. But you're looking at teams like potentially Essendon, but Essendon's got their fingers in a few pies at the moment, so to speak. You've got Danaher, Fantasia, and the Saad deals to work out. They've also got to worry about deals for Jai Caldwell and potentially Seb Ross, as has been reported today, has been touring their facilities. The Saints also have probably all tied up with uh, Brad Crouch joining the club. Mind you, if Seb Ross goes, maybe it does free them up. Alternatively, you're looking at someone like North and Carlton, who probably do have a fair bit to spend, and someone like a Carlton as well, with uh, a slightly brighter future than North, you would say, might be a prime candidate. Let me know in the comments what you think is going to happen with this deal and if you think Collingwood are doing right by Trelaw right now. I really do hope the Pies have a plan. Whether or not that involves Jeremy Cameron, I'm not too sure. But as I alluded to, it does sound like he is headed off to the Cats, which is another interesting conversation altogether. Talking about a team who nearly won the grand final is going to add Jeremy Cameron to their list and potentially have this year's and last year's Coleman medalists in their forward line. Yes, they're likely going to lose Harry Taylor in addition to Gary Ablett, but if you add Cameron and they've been linked to guys like Isaac Smith and Sean Higgins as well, it's quite conceivable that Geelong get better again in 2021. Geelong are a ridiculously admirable team. Every year there is talk about them getting worse and dropping down the ladder due to age. Last year they lost one of their best performers the previous season, Tim Kelly, to the Eagles and still finished higher than the Eagles that year. Last year I did make the comment I thought the Cats by investing heavily into last year's draft through the Kelly trade, might be slowly starting to turn the list over and push towards youth. But Chris Scott has come out and said he wants to push hard for a premiership with this team. Now, I don't think it's likely that they get Sean Higgins and Isaac Smith, but if you add just one of them to the goal-scoring power of Jeremy Cameron back in his hometown where he's happy again, a player that reportedly didn't cope well with the hub situation and won a Coleman just 12 months ago, this would be easily as big a deal as Tim Kelly to West Coast last season. If anyone's going to try the argument that Geelong are going to slide down the ladder in 2021, I'm going to have to disagree with you. I think the Cats are primed for a big year once again. Now, they're not the only finalist this year who appears to be making moves to strengthen the list. Someone like a St. Kilda is low-key back at it again. They've more or less secured Brad Crouch through free agency, and it does depend on how much they offer him financially, of course, as to whether they need to give up a pick, because obviously Adelaide can match any offer that doesn't give them band one compensation. I know Brad Crouch hasn't had the greatest couple of years on the field. Obviously, Adelaide plummeted to a spoon, and then obviously he got in trouble with the law this season as well. But I do think in a new environment, in a team that is pushing for finals again, he can reach his potential. And I think he'd be a very, very good midfielder for the Saints. On top of that, they look like adding potentially Jack Higgins for potentially a second rounder. He's been through a lot, but undoubtedly he is one of the most talented kids from a already strong 2017 draft class. If the Saints add Brad Crouch and Jack Higgins to their best 22, I'm starting to think they could well and truly be in the thick of it next season as well. But of course, this isn't going to be a completely normal offseason as well in terms of trades. Potentially reduced list sizes and we're still waiting for clarification on exactly what those will be. But there's also salary cap implications on that as well. So the result of that is you might find some players who wouldn't normally deserve to be delisted get delisted. This in addition to maybe some uncertainty around this year's draft with a little bit ex less exposure, you might see some clubs could pick up some very valuable delisted 
free agents as well. In particular, I'm looking at someone like a Lockie Schultz, who is unsigned at Fremantle, purely because obviously they're waiting to trade Jesse Hogan or Connor Blakely, but if they don't trade either of those players, they actually might not have room for a guy who is easily best 22 at the moment. At my club, I'm looking at guys like Nathan Vardy and Mark Hutchings, who you know, aren't world beaters as well, but they would probably slot into a couple of best 22s around the league and might not make it due to salary cap. Let me know in the comments who's someone at your club who remains unsigned that might cop a delisting this year that you think shouldn't, largely due to reduced list sizes. Anyway, guys, that's pretty much all I got at the moment for the AFL trade news. There are a lot of rumors swirling, and I'm sure it'll just get more and more hectic as the next couple of weeks progress. If you want me to do more videos like this, talking about current trade events, by all means, let me know in the comments. It all moves so fast at the moment that it's hard to actually get time to sit down, do a video, and talk about something that isn't gonna be outdated in the following day. But potentially, we might do a live stream, particularly I'm thinking on the trade period deadline day in that last hour we did that last year, and that was a lot of fun. If you're new to the channel, make sure you hit subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.